hey, good to see you back for human domain architecture for our four pieces uh, compendium of, um, of, of paradise in perfection in its uh, post-contact way. And the piece of architecture that has defined resort architecture in the world and has started out here in Hawaii. We're going to have with us for that uh, the architect, um, long-term friend and business partner, Ronald Lincoln from Long Beach, California. Hi, Ron. Hello. And we have our co-host, Bishop Museum historian, DeSilva Brown. Hi, DeSilva. Hello. Hello, 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 everybody. So without further ado, not to waste any more time, let's go to the first slide, please. And you, Ron, please recap and add a little bit to what where we uh, ended last time, where we pick up from now. So we're on yeah, slide I'm one. I'm happy to see uh, slide one, which again is the site plan of the hotel, because uh, another look at the site plan reveals some very special hotel features. Dick Kingsworth was convinced that every hotel, if it was going to be successful, that there had to be a dramatic sense of arrival, uh, a feeling of having come to a very special place, an unforgettable place. Well, he provides this, as you see in the site plan, at the far left, it begins with a long anticipatory roadway that ramped up between some dense landscapes in it, which was actually a sort of a green tunnel after everything had a chance to grow. But then you arrived uh, in a happy contrast in a very sunny, expansive motor course where you see the four trees clustered on the drawing. Now, this motor court, and many people don't know this, was built on an artificial datum about 18 feet above natural grade. And what fills the void beneath the motor court? That happens to be where the hotel kitchens and the back of house service spaces are, are located. And at the head of the motor court, in the very center of that drawing, you see uh, a rectangle designated as number three. That's where Ed put a very grand lobby and lounge to sort of culminate the, uh, the memorable arrival experience. And again, because the lobby was raised up, the guests and visitors, when they came into the lobby, they could look over and above a lagoon, which we'll talk about more later, uh, the oval swimming pool, the pool terrace, the beachfront, the ocean, and beautifully off in the distance, a romantic uh, a glimpse of uh, Cocoa Head. And this sort of impressive welcoming experience was a calculated design on Ed's part because he wanted to heighten the guest anticipation of what the entire resort might offer in terms of filling their dreams of living in a luxurious tropical paradise, even if only temporarily. First impressions at a hotel are all important. If they are successful, you'll have those guests coming back. They'll bring their kids back and their grandchildren back again. Uh, if we go to the next slide, on the left, you're seeing another tantalizing glimpse of uh, the hotel's uh, architecture. This happens to be a view from a guest room Lanai, again looking out to Cocoa Head. To the right is something that the Soto has found for us, which I'm sure is from some sort of Hilton uh, brochure. And I think that that particular view, an, uh, again, another watercolor, is probably the first time that the traveling public have a chance to see what uh, the Hilton Corporation had in mind for building there. And on the text below, it says, far from the matting crowd. So right from the start, even before the hotel opened, they were advertising the hotel as uh, something quiet and private and away from the matting crowd of YCT. It's exactly if right. Sounds like, so, sounds like socially distant, which reminds us to tell the audience we're in the midst of the <laughs> Corona pandemic. <laughs> exactly. Unfortunately, exactly correct. That next slide is a very ar early architectural rendering done in Killingsworth's office. And this is probably the first time that uh, residents of Oahu saw what the Kahala Corporation was up to because it was published extensively in both of the major newspapers that existed at that time. And note that there are two 10-story guest room buildings offset at an elevator core, 
And from that core, one- and two-story buildings extend out to the ocean. The, uh, these low-rise buildings contain that raised entry lobby that we'll look at soon and lounge. And they were all above several restaurants that were below at natural grade at the uh, lagoon level. And, you know, Ron, I think we can point out, too, that this rendering is not the way the, the actual hotel was constructed. One of the things is the lagoon has some additional things in it, like an island, as well as a building that was supposed to be in there, which never was built like that. And also, it's got a port cochere that extends out into the center of that motor port that you mentioned earlier, which kind of surrounds the trees that were there, and that was never built that way either. It's something that strikes me as being, as being very timely is that the illustrator put vegetation on, so it's, a, it's something that we in the past like to call archie nature as a hybrid between architecture and nature. Right. We like that. Yeah, and as Ron just pointed out to me before we did the show, the initial plan was that planter boxes would be placed on the exterior of the building with bougainvillea vines that were supposed to grow and cover up oh. the exterior, but they never really thrived, and so that didn't end up actually happening the way Ed had thought it might. Oh, well, that's a very uh, signature element of the killing square uh, yeah. over, right? Yeah. yeah as, as, Ed, as, Ed would have, as Ed would have said, uh, you you win some and you lose some. There you go. But the salt air and the heavy trade winds just didn't allow the bougainvillea and those beautiful splashes of color that he always thought would create a, a wonderful touch uh, and a, a humane touch to the hotel. It couldn't happen. Mm. But if we look at the next slide on the left, you see those benign, and you see, again, you see just how lively that facade again. Uh, I seem to be fixated on Cocoa Head. Every picture is there has Cocoa Head off in the distance. I was going to ask uh, you, Desiree, what you thought about that interesting Hilton brochure, the color photograph on the right. Well, I think that that is an extremely strange way to depict a hotel in the Hawaiian Islands in which there is a young woman in the foreground sitting on the sand who looks as though she might be local or, or Hawaiian, but the overwhelming image is this background picture of this beautiful green-eyed blonde woman. And today, this really wouldn't fly. You would not be advertising something here with a picture of a beautiful, ultra-Aryan-looking woman. And to me, that picture looks like it's more like a cosmetics ad for, for lipstick or something than it is for a hotel. But there is always this, this – this brochure, by the way, was published before the hotel was even completed. So they weren't able to put any pictures of the actual site in or the building because it hadn't been constructed yet. So – Somebody said, oh, here's a beautiful picture, and um, this will attract attention, so we'll use it. To me, it seems very strangely inappropriate, but, again, this is 1963, 64. Well, to spice up the discussion, I think I was talking to Bill Chapman today, and he kind of assured us of that we, the three of us, have inspired him to appreciate more what one could summarize as a more cosmopolitan. Yeah. A college and a sort of a strictly regionalist, which we tend to like to uh, sort of default back to these days as almost the easy way out. While this one, he was saying, well, we're actually part of the world, right? We're, we're rooted in Hawaii, but our approach is, is, is again, is across all borders, right? It's well, that's true, and that is something that we're going to talk about in a later show in this series when we talk about the Hilton that was built in West Berlin, for example, because Hilton at that yeah, time yeah. was was expanding, as, as we said last week, internationally. And in fact, if you look at the logo underneath the word Hilton on this brochure, that is the in Hotel Il Hilton International logo mm -hmm. that, Ron, you mentioned a while ago, um, that, was, that was part of, they were saying that the Kahala Hilton was part of the international set of Hilton. That's correct. And uh, the next slide uh, is we're finally showing uh, our audience the true appearance of the hotel. And Ed Killings was convinced that exposed structure could be any modern building's worthy and enlivening ornamentation. And the surprisingly delicate appearance of this all-concrete hotel 
was realized by interlacing some horizontal floor beam extensions out from the building and linking them with, with some slim vertical struts. And together they formed a continuous trellis over the facades that, as you notice, continues right up and over the roof. Uh, the trellis supports those floating lanais from the guest rooms, but it also enlivens the facades because there's constantly changing shadow play. Not just tropical sunlight, but the, the very scintillating full moon appearance that the building can take as well. Uh, up at the upper right uh, corner, the postcard designer has taken some artistic license <laughs> because the palm trees would have to be about 250 feet tall uh, in that in that particular rendering. Yeah, so either the palm trees are natural size and the building is very shrunken and miniature, or the palm trees are absurdly too tall and tower over the building. <laughs> and in the next slide, uh, on, on the right side, again, you're seeing the guest room and eyes, but we put this photo there because it shows the relationship between the hotel and the adjacent Kahala Beach apartment. And the Kahala Beach apartments were also developed by the local Hawaiian Charles Peach and also designed by Killingsworth. And we had the pleasure together to present uh, the Kahala Beach apartments to the viewers uh, not that long ago. To the left are some very typical 1960s uh, advertisements for all of the things you would hope to find there in the 1960s. And uh, DeSoto, you pointed out uh, some wonderful go-go boots and Mondrian <laughs> dresses that are very yes. 60s in the center of the picture. Yes, actually, you pointed that out, and I was really pleased that you saw that. Those three people were actually entertainers from Japan who were appearing at the hotel in the 1960s, not long after it opened, and they got photographed with a leaping dolphin as part of as a publicity picture, and they got put into the brochure to emphasize that, yes, this is a swinging, modern, 60s place, and uh, even though it's a world apart, it isn't outside the mainstream, so, you know, we, we're, we're up to date here. We've got go-go boots. And once again, uh, no hula skirt and no coconut bra. Exactly, exactly, right. We're emphasizing modernity. We're emphasizing currents, you know, the, how, how up-to-date and modern we are, not yep. that it's old Hawaii. Yeah. In, in the next slide, uh, you can see the hotel uh, facility a bit closer. It's exposed painted post and beam construction at probably the grandest scale that I've experienced. And the possibilities inherent in concrete were all used here. The building was made up of port and plate based concrete, recast, pre stress, post tension, you name it. It was all there to create probably Ed's most successful example of what I called structural expressionism, but none of that would have been possible at all without the guidance of the gentleman that appears at the upper right picture, Al Yi, who was the premier structural engineer working out of Honolulu, who famously worked for decades all throughout the Pacific region and Southeast Asia. Yeah, and it's a beautiful, it's a magnificent structure, and particularly because you see on the right how it is held up by these very what look very like very delicate little holes holding it up and it's not a big heavy huge looking thing it looks very light despite the fact that it's concrete correct the, the next slide is a southern view from one of those floating guest rooms with a beautiful bottle i wish i knew who she was but it takes in the view of that classical swimming pool in the beachfront and in the upper uh, right corner, uh, Martin, you, Suzanne, and I appear to be at the hotel, but unfortunately, we weren't there at the same time. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and if we look at the next hotel, you'll see just what DeSoto was talking about. There's those columns or pilates of concrete supporting 10 stories of guest room, and they do look delicate somehow. Uh, partly because they've been detailed with inset panels and so forth to make the column interesting and create some more shadows that thin up the uh, the appearance of the structure. At the upper right, you're seeing the first look at the lagoon, and one of Al Yee's presents to us, which was this wonderful, very slim uh, 
bridge with no handrails that went across the lagoon. And you pointed out a really interesting thing, Ron, which was that when the dolphins were first put in there, they would jump over that that very skinny, slim bridge because there was nothing to obstruct them because there were no railings. And while that sounds wonderful, it is not wonderful if they happen to run into somebody who was standing there. I also can remember that dolphins do like to flip their noses in the water and splash people. And as you can see in this picture, the bridge is wet. So they did, in fact, splash onto the bridge. And if you were standing there, you either thought that was funny or you took great offense at getting wet. <laughs> yeah, you wonder what kind of liability insurance. Yeah, you wonder what kind of liability insurance would have to cover that. But if you look at the, uh, today, next, yes. at the next slide, you see the dolphins at play because the lagoon became a, a really a tropical playground, not just for these bottlenose Atlantic dolphins, but also some rays, sea turtles, tropical fish, and in the right corner you see some lucky humans, very heavily supervised children. And uh, this lagoon and the use of uh, dolphins and dolphin play as part of the experience of the hotel was a very new thing. Kahala, if it wasn't the first hotel to do it, might have been one of the very first. That's about the most I can say from our research. Yeah. But if we look at and, the and, next... And you guys, you guys pointed out to me that... Um, the dolphins are currently the main uh, revenue generator in the crisis yeah. while the hotel is shut down, right? Yeah, right. Because they offer online uh, uh, contact. Yes. That, that was one of the – yeah, we, we all looked at a, a news report about how people can pay to have some FaceTime, as it, were, as it were, with the dolphins, and one of them will actually paint a picture for you. It is not inexpensive, but it does look like it's very interesting. I also want to point out that at the time the hotel opened, and Ron, you will remember this, I'm sure, dolphins were kind of a popular thing in American pop culture, and there was a TV series based on the previous series Lassie called Flipper, which was about Happy Dolphin, who was a friend to some boys in Florida. So oh, dolphins yes. were cool at the time. They even brought it to Germany, and I watched that as a kid. So, just to <laughs> let you know. I grew up with Flipper, too. Was he called Flipper in German? He was. They translated it to the girl. And, in fact, we just watched it here with a kid down there a couple of weeks ago, and they've never <laughs> seen it. They got a kick out of it. <laughs> kind of. Well, speaking, speaking of the Dolphin Lagoon, that next photograph shows a... a a black and white picture on the left. If that rather elegant woman would turn around 180 degrees, she'd be looking down over the lagoon. Right. But this is a picture of the uh, hotel entry lobby. I think it's its grandest lobby and most memorable lobby that he designed. Is uh, and it was very much a classicist. And so this is spacious. It has 30 foot ceilings. It's absolutely symmetrical. There are some floor to ceiling glazing, letting light in, uh, and the play of light on the floors and walls. But especially interesting is the fact that very traditional hanging art glass chandeliers are there, which have been uh, have been there ever since the hotel opened. They're still there now, and are, are incredibly memorable when one is, sees them for the first time. Uh, I'd like to say that one of the uh, successes of Ed's hotel is that. He was able to comfortably combine this modern building, classical touches, traditional touches like the chandelier, but all in a sort of well, but all with a warm and welcoming touch of Hawaiiana. Uh, the pictures on the right are color shots, and back when the hotel opened, uh, two New York lighting designers, both who had theater experience, a lot of Broadway experience, were called on to design all of the. Uh, lighting fixtures, which are custom. And these photographs show just how important custom lighting design brings to the hotel so that it comes alive theatrically at night. Uh, the woman who designed the chandeliers was named Irene McGowan. Her partner and younger uh, assistant was named Leslie Wheel. Uh, 
Irene also designed the Hanson Chandelier in the entry lobby of the Kahala Beach Apartments. And 20 years later, Leslie Wheel came back to the Holly Kalani Hotel and designed all of the lighting there. So we've had wonderful lighting from these two wonderful women. And, and the Holly uh, Kalani having been designed by you, Ron, and there are three shows about that, just to let the audience indeed. know. And, you yeah, you know, also, too, stuff. Before we before we mm-hmm. leave, just quickly too, you mentioned Ron that the this entry lobby has got these three domes in the ceiling, which were also a major engineering feat, and you can see them particularly because they they have the chandeliers hanging from them, and that's an important part of that ambience of that that entry space too. Yeah, and it was, it's a very classical cut to have shallow domes in a flat ceiling. But they also worked for people in the guest rooms who didn't have to look down on just a flat, yeah. unordinary expanse of concrete because yeah. they don't get into the air. Yeah. Right. How are we doing on time? We're doing good. Let's go to that uh, restaurant on the next slide. Uh, the illustration yeah, I just, of it. I, I, this is a very 60s rendering because in the 60s, architects, uh, obviously didn't have computer drawings yet, yeah. but there were all these wonderful, fresh watercolor drawings. Yeah. Uh, this just happens to be a beautiful curved stair that goes down from the lobby level to a bar and a waiting area uh, where one would sit for a while before going into the very popular Miley restaurant that would have been in the right of the picture. And in fact, the next photograph in black and white shows... Again, how it put a touch of something very traditional in a modern building. Uh, at the same time, those lighting fixtures hung uh, from the columns designed by uh, Louis Wheel with more of that art glass gives another touch of tradition. But at the same time, the walls that surrounded the stairway uh, are covered in black lava, which in turn were festooned with live orchids. And so here again, we get this touch of Hawaiiana, modernism, and traditionalism quite comfortably combined, which was yeah. a great uh, success here at the hotel. And something which was really popular at the time, which we see very clearly here, is the contrast of the rough textured lava rock and the smooth white concrete surfaces. And paired with often shiny terrazzo flooring, this was very common in the small hotels that were built here in the 1950s, as well as the Hawaiian Village Hotel from starting from 1955, that was a really popular look and something that yeah, I think really sums that area up, that time period up. Yeah. And if I'm curious about more about that, there are two shows that Soda, you and I did. They're yeah. called Volcanic Volume and Volcanic Veneer. Exactly. You guys exactly. can do further research when you watch them. Yes. Fun going on. Yeah, speaking of, of uh, the 1960s, the next slide is a whole series of advertising shots taken of what people would expect to enjoy uh, at the hotel. If you look at the center picture, you'll see some of the lagoons. Uh, you'll see the, the Dolphin Lagoon in there at play for an appreciative crowd. But the photo shows that in 1967, a series of cottages were built around the lagoon that completely enclosed it, and they had guest rooms in them. Uh, they had typical double-pitched Hawaiian tile roofs, uh, and they, uh, again, give a nice touch of Hawaiiana. But the picture at the lower left shows, again, why Ed was so disappointed. Someone took this picture through pink bougainvillea flowers from a lanai, which, of course, didn't survive, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, and you know all oh, of the aging, right? Yes, that's exactly right. You know the the and I as I remember, Ron, those lagoon side rooms were probably premier rooms because of their setting. They weren't in the high rise, so I think those were potentially the more expensive ones because you were down right next to the happy dolphins, etc. I think you're right. Uh, I've stayed in the lagoon uh, dolphin rooms. And in the morning, they're always up before I am, and they're always making wonderful noises, kind of chuckling to yes. themselves, uh, yes. waking me up in a wonderful <laughs> tropical way. <laughs> that that next fix, that next picture is an interesting. Uh, it's a shot by again the famous photographer Julia Shulman, 
he used a very special day for night lens to get this incredibly dramatic picture that almost makes it look like it's in full moonshine or something. But uh, uh, Julius loved his his uh, lenses, and here's a case of where he used it. Yeah. Uh, any comments about the picture in the upper right, uh, Martin or Soto? Well, it sort of uh, segues us and we're getting to the end of the show, to so the next slide, which um, our friend and Andrea Brissi, who had us over in his apartment in the adjacent Kahala apartment, uh, he told us that for him and for almost every other architectural photographer, Julius is the big hero. So he was you know, triggered by that to one of these nights get out when the moon seemed to be equally perfect. And that's his apprentice piece here that I'm sure Julius will acknowledge a lot. So thanks, Andrea, and kudos. And the, and the next shot is indeed what Andrea uh, filmed of the hotel in lockdown without, without a soul. We've been told that in less than two weeks, in fact, in June 1st, the hotel is scheduled to open again. If we go to the next and last picture for this week's uh, episode, you'll see a shot that, that I think you took, this photo of yes. the... That long, wrapping drive uh, in the green tunnel of vegetation that's closed off in the pandemic. Yes. Uh, but in the upper uh, right, uh, Martin found an interesting connection between his uh, home country and Hawaii. Yeah, Ron is that, Martin. Yeah. And in more in particularly Suzanne's uh, location, which is Bavaria, the most southern in Germany, which Americans consider to be German, as German as you can get. And here on this ashtray that clearly is labeled belonging to the hotel, we see that green um, print, which is basically identifying it having been produced in Bavaria. So here we got another connection between <laughs> us, broadcasting me from here close to Munich, and you guys both in Hawaii and Long Beach, California, and so with that, we look forward to do this again in next week's shows. And that one will be more about your fingerprint or the absence of it by intention of the uh, Kahala Hilton, uh, Ron. And we look much forward to that. Well, I will be there, and everybody else should be, too. That's all I can say. And thank yes, you both for the privilege of being there myself. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, and see you all next week. And until then, please stay as perfectly exotic as Ron and Ed. Bye. Bye.